no role plays, just real. Chris and Lorenzo share four decades of combined experience to help you become a more effective leader. We've never really, as a workforce, spent a lot of time on making sure we're developing good leaders. We'll be able to share stories, experience, mistakes, uh, failures, successes. This is Hacking Your Leadership. Welcome to Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Chris. And I'm Lorenzo. And Lorenzo, on this episode, I want to talk about something that happened to me on a phone call a few days ago, I, w- I was talking with some people in a conference call about kind of the differences, a lot of the differences between, you know, how we used to do things in 2018, 2019 versus today. And one of the people on the call was, had only been with the organization um, that I was consulting for for about maybe six or eight months. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, that's that's got to be rough, you know, to have to onboard into an environment that is completely remote, whereas, you know, before you had the 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 kind of the benefit of being able to be in person with everybody and kind of you you get walked around the office and you get, you know, shown all the systems and all all the things you kind of need to do to kind of orient yourself and integrate yourself. And um and then, you know, you take everything remote and then all of a sudden I I think it could feel very, very disconnecting and and Mm -hmm. very like uh, like you're kind of left out there in the deep end to kind of find all these things yourself kind of thing. And it was exactly the opposite of what I was thinking. They said, no, that it's been absolutely amazing that the onboarding experience was great. They feel completely kind of in the loop. They feel like they they know everything they're supposed to know and all the systems and all the the, the different ways of communication. It's all been perfect in in contrast with the last company they worked for you know, and that would have been five or six years in the past, it did feel very disconnected, even though they were in an office. And the the reason I'm, I can only assume is that no one really took it upon themselves to do that stuff for them in, in, in the past. Whereas now I kind of think people assume that, oh my gosh, we have a new employee. They're not going to be able to get integrated unless we really make this happen for them. And so people are actually prioritizing this, whereas before it's just kind of assumed, oh, yeah, it'll get done, right? <laughs> There's a team of 10 people here. It'll get done. We'll find some way of getting it done. But nobody nobody really gets it done. Have you seen anything similar to this? Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's interesting because one of the things coming out of you know the, the kind of move to virtual for a lot of organizations that were forced to do it was – you had to come up with very clear strategies uh, around how are you going to do things that you've always done before and how are you going to make it come to life in the virtual environment. And I think something like employee onboarding, to your point, most organizations, like, you know, you go through an interview process, you talk to a recruiter, you talk to a hiring manager, you get a job offer, you know, you you go to the office on your first day and you find out, like, this is where you're going to work and here are the people around you. And then maybe there's a little bit of, um, let me show you around the office. And then, you know, here's your resources. And like, it's kind of, to your point, like, it's a village of like, here's, you know, here's what you're going to be doing, and here's the person you'll spend your time with, and you know, here's maybe somebody's going to to show you how to do the job that you're here to do. Uh, versus, I think what ended up happening with so much in the virtual space was like, well, who's going to own this? Who's going to make sure, you know, the people that are coming in not only know what they're supposed to do, but they have a time to connect with people. Like so much of it, again, there just there had to be so much more structure to it that I think a lot of companies. Um, you know, out of necessity and out of concern of, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Really made some great plans and some great ways to engage people specifically in onboarding. And it's one of the things now that I think as we go back into a lot of companies' physical spaces and figuring that out again, it's going to be interesting to see, like, how do you now take from what you had to do virtually and then bring it into the physical space, especially in an example like this, where uh, where it it may it may feel like oh this this really had to be you know this is not this is not what we normally do. So I'm sure it wasn't great. You know I wonder how we did to find out actually it was way better than we've ever done before. Um, and now that you're in the physical world, how do you bring that to life here? And I think that's going to be a new challenge for a lot of these types of things. Yeah, I, I agree. As you're walking through that, I'm thinking you know, the process of interviewing and hiring somebody as you, you walk through those steps, I just, I was thinking the whole time, yeah, it's very structured, right? Like every, there is a job. You either, you're, you are the, the person doing the interview. You're the person making the job offer. You're the per like, all those things are very structured and everybody has a, a very clear responsibility in the process of, of hiring a new person. 
And then all of a sudden that person starts on their first day and then it's just kind of like, yeah, we all do it. You know, we all, yeah. we all mm-hmm. get this done together. And you know, the old saying, when it's everybody's job, it's nobody's job, right? So mm-hmm. th- th- this, you know, the, the idea of moving into a, a virtual environment, I think these are things that organizations that have been virtual for years and years and years, th- this is a muscle that they naturally know how to flex anyway, because if, if it's not somebody's specific job, then it won't get done. And so you can't just say that it's everybody's job to get this new new person up to speed. Um, it has to be Lorenzo's job. You 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 are going to be the one making sure that this new employee knows this thing and this thing and this thing. And then on their third day, Chris, it's your job. You're going to do this thing and this thing and this thing. And and in an office, you know maybe it, you know the, maybe the boss comes and says, "All right, Chris and Lorenzo, and you know your your three other coworkers, I need you to make sure that." Uh, the gym here is up to speed, you know? <laughs> All right. All right. We got this. <laughs> we got this. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Jim on his second week is going, I don't have no idea what I'm doing or I do, but I'm, I, I know how to do the job, but I don't know how to access systems. I don't know where things are. I don't know, you know, what, what's, what's this authenticator app I need to use to log into this system. You know, what's, you know, Oh wait, you guys use Slack. I didn't even know that, you know, that it's all these different things that, that kind of you find out just by doing and and it's such a better experience when you find out because somebody has been intentional about letting you know. And I think why this is so important right now is that, you know, there's – turnover is higher than ever. And and turnover among new employees is especially higher than ever. The There's this kind of like, um, you know, there's this kind of like – part of this, t- this time when a new employee gets hired, if they hit a year of employment where you can kind of go, whew, huh, we, we made it, you know, like it, they're, they're less likely to leave an organization once they've hit that one year mark. But, but really it's pretty high, the, the level of turnover of people during that first year. And I think a lot of that comes from not feeling like they are integrated into whatever that system is, the culture, the, they, they don't, they don't know inherently what they're supposed to be doing every single day. And, and the, the lack of that being done by leaders and, uh, and employees as a person is onboarding becomes glaring when it comes to a person's exit interviews as they leave an organization after six months and they're asked why. Uh, a lot of them report saying feeling very disconnected from the organization. They've been hired six months and they still don't feel like there's a, there's a connection there. Um, I, I, I believe that this is one large part of why that disconnection is there. Yeah, you know, it's interesting too because I think of, you know, just in – in a lot of the virtual space, I think a lot of leaders spent time just calendarizing and, and really like taking into account, wanting to stay connected, wanting to talk to everyone, looking to fill kind of a day of a calendar with all these virtual meetings. And while on the surface, it can seem like a pain in, in the butt. It's also like it's creating these cadences and these, you know, can like it's kind of creating this continuity of communication with their people where when you go into a physical office, you know, lunch goes long, you get caught up talking to somebody in the hallway, uh, you know, a call comes in, it's unexpected. Like these things happen where maybe the access to the leader um, is, is not so rigid in regards to the time that's being scheduled to spend with people, but that's definitely happening a lot in the virtual world. And it's because like, then it feels like you hit the lottery when somebody cancels a call. Or right. they're like, hey, we're going to, you know, and you're like, oh my gosh, I just got 30 minutes back or an hour back <laughs> that, that I was, you know, that's on my calendar. I might not even delete that calendar, right? Like it might just let, let it sit there yes. unless somebody else does to kind of get that space back where, you know, in a physical space and in an office and in and, and just the walking to different places and things like that, like you have a lot more of this um, in between time that is unaccounted for, which is fine. I think that that's, you know, you need to have that space in your life. But I think that to your point, like the the companies and the leaders who, who spend a lot of time being very connected to their people, um, both with like, actual formal updates and conversations, but also like doing the virtual happy hours and things like that. Like those things became something that had happened to just say like, we're not going to talk about work at all. We're just going to, you know, pop on our cameras and have a drink and like listen to some music and just talk to each other. Like again, in, in most instances, in most organizations, there is not that level of, of strategy and, and, and intent to build in these blocks of time where you're just connecting with people. Um, and again, I think that's something that, uh, that there's something to, to, to learn from that. There's something to take from that coming back into spaces where you were physically with one another again. 
um, and thinking about how and where do you spend your time? Obviously, it's better when things naturally happen when it comes to relationships, right? You want to be very intentional and very on purpose when it comes to uh, you know, an employee onboarding from the perspective of do they have the tools and systems and access and knowledge they need to in order to do their job well? Do they uh, do they do they feel like they have everything at their fingertips, or do they feel like they're ho- constantly having to reach out for answers to questions? To be up, to be very purposeful on that, I think is a very good thing. And this is whether you are in a remote environment or in the office. When it comes to relationships, things that happen naturally are better in general. And and if you're in an office, you are more likely to have those things happen naturally. You're more likely to have people who, you know, just naturally come across each other walking to the water cooler or, you know, getting a cup of coffee, you know, turning around in a cubicle and hearing each other talk, you know, overhearing a conversation between two people and going, oh, I can contribute to that. And, and, and then you start making friends that way. But I will tell you the, the, the kind of negative aspect of that is a lot of people assume who they're going to make connections with and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You find people who look like you and sound like you and talk like you and who uh, seem like maybe they're the same age-ish as you or who might have the same, you know, might be in the same place in their life as you in terms of whether you're married or not, whether you have kids or not, like these kind of natural things that we use as jumping off points for creating relationships with people. And a, a huge benefit about this, the about being remote when it comes to these relationships and creating them is that you have to be very intentional about creating the spaces needed in order to make those relationships happen. You have to schedule it. You have to say, we're going to get together on, on a team call and there's going to be an icebreaker where you talk about this and this and this about yourself. And we're going to go around a circle and everybody's going to do that thing. And it can seem very contrived and it can seem very, you know, uh, kind of forced, but without that, it wouldn't happen at all, right? Because you're, you're in a remote environment. It wouldn't happen at all. And so when you do these things from a standpoint of it being kind of forced or at least scheduled, you open up doors for who is creating relationships with whom. People who can look to other people to create relationships with and and using jumping off points that it, that never would have happened in an office environment because of the way we naturally kind of segregate ourselves. And I, I, I like this a lot if leaders do it correctly. It can't seem like, you know, the like the office space environment where it's like no one wants to be there anyway and we're trying to like make things fun, but we don't do a terrible job of it. There there has to be something in the culture already and it's the leader's responsibility to make that happen as well as to be the first person putting themselves out there to talk about themselves, to, to say, this is how I connect myself to you. This is how I connect myself to the business. Um, because you, if you can't lead by that example, you, you can't expect your people to do it. It's interesting. There's two things there that, that stuck out to me. Like, I think it'd, it'd be cool to see if there's any research being done around the reduction of unconscious bias as a result of the structure of virtual meetings. Oh, yeah. Because that's sure. what you're talking about, right? Yeah, like the, the reality is that by forcing people to come together more often from a calendar standpoint, um, those interactions and that space together is causing people to spend more time together to learn more about each other in different ways that may be crossing bridges and building relationships that naturally would not have happened. I think that's a really interesting concept. I think the other thing to think about is, you know, what's who's to say that you're, you know, you know, if you're you're so willing to to create a virtual call and where people take it from their desk or from their home, and you can say, we're going to do that twice a day to make sure that, quote unquote, people are being productive or that you have updates for me while you're working from home. Who's to say you can't have those same two meetings in a physical environment in an office? Why can't you say, like, you know what, I know you're going to be working for two hours in the morning, but every day at 11 o'clock, we're going to go meet in the big boardroom. And we're yeah. going to just say hi, and we're going to have some coffee, and we're going to connect with one another. How's your morning been so far? What's going on? What updates do you have? Great. Go back out and do your work again. And we're going to meet again at 2.30 for 30 minutes back in this boardroom again. And, 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 and the, in the normal space of offices, you'd be like, well, that's interrupting my work twice a day. But in the virtual world, it was required. Right. And it was interrupting your work, and it was making, but but it was it was creating a space of productivity, and maybe a different approach that again would be really different. And people would say like, well, that's like, why would you make people get up out of their desk and go meet in this conference room? Why would I make you log in at home? Why do I, why would I make you stop doing what you were doing and pop into this this virtual room? Without that, 
it's assumed that isn't needed because it's assumed that those things naturally happen anyway because you're in an office. And what what these last two years have shown us is that if you aren't intentional about it in a remote environment, it clearly won't happen. That's not even an argument that has to be made. Like people just naturally won't interact on anything but a work level if you don't schedule it to happen. And and if you are transitioning now from a completely remote environment to going back to the office or even a hybrid model, anything like that, these things that you did as a leader in order to make sure that there was good culture on the team, that people got along and could you know, connect with each other, the, these kind of intentional acts that may have seemed forced in the moment, but that you knew in your heart was necessary in order to help people feel connected to the business. Those weren't bad things, even when you're in an office environment, they're, 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 they can still be good things now. And if you go back to assuming it's just going to happen naturally because, oh, we're all in the building again, I, I think you're going to go, you're, you're, you're in for a rude awakening in terms of what people won't do when it's not actually scheduled for them. Now, I'm not saying it won't happen a little bit, but it won't happen in the way that is most beneficial to your team and to your to your coworkers and to the organization as a whole. Where it happens beneficially to everybody is when the leaders can kind of take a role in, in forcing that starting point and then allowing the, the relationships to occur naturally from there. But that starting point, that jumping off point sometimes has to be forced or scheduled in, in order to kind of coax employees out of whatever shell that they're in or whatever routines that they're in that might be stopping them from creating relationships with people that they normally wouldn't or stopping them from interacting with people they normally wouldn't. And and when you have a team that has the cohesion of where everybody gets along with everybody and where they're where everybody is equally accepted and included in this in this team itself you have just unstoppable productivity because you don't you you have psychological safety you have people who can voice concerns to each other because they feel like there's an actual relationship there i mean the, the sky's the limit on what a team like that can do um it, 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 and and we're seeing this out of teams that were remote because these are the things they did in order to remain connected absolutely it's a great call and with that it brings us to this episode's 1 minute hack but first a few words from our sponsors the One Minute Hack. All right, for this episode's One Minute Hack, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about the routines and the intentional things you had in place both prior to 2020 and today. And, and if you are in an environment where you transitioned from an office environment to a remote environment and, and back again, you might have an easier time doing this because you're looking at the kind of the contrast between the two. But regardless of your situation, even if you were always remote or always in person and nothing ever changed, you need to be thinking about ways that you can interrupt the status quo. Think about ways that you can look at how your team interacts with each other and how relationships are built and how people feel connected to the business and think about how could that be better and, and come up with ways of making sure that that is happening intentionally when it won't happen if it is not intentional. And and again, this isn't like no one will talk to each other if I don't do anything as a leader. No, it'll it'll happen. But it's, it's not just about making it happen on its own and letting the chips fall where they may. It's about being intentional about structuring it in a way to where the, the, the best possible outcomes can occur in terms of the relationships that, that happen naturally on their own, but you're kind of creating this jumping off point for people. Um, think about ways you can do that amongst your team. Uh, a lot of times you can implement ways that you were doing it during the pandemic back into the office environment. But again, if it's not happening naturally on its own, it's up to you as a leader to start this ball rolling. Yeah, I think it's a great woman to hack. And just a reminder of, of the intention that we have to build connections with people where um, sometimes, uh, it, you know, it, you always want it to be just organic and natural and authentic. Uh, but as a leader, there is a little bit of a responsibility to find these times and spaces to build that allow there to be that opportunity um, versus just everybody with their head down doing the work and then having only meetings where it's only about business and it's only about updates makes it difficult for people to, to build those personal connections. Um, so I, I think that probably more of that is needed um, as we move forward, you know, and, and build the cultures that we want to have where people have a lot more, um, you know, reasons and needs to be connected to one another to stay with the work and to do great, great with the job. Right, right. If, if you are seeing any type of issue at all with turnover and retention and engagement in your organization, these are the things that get helped the most 
when you implement policies like this and 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 structure like this. These are the these are the things that will slowly over time connect people to your organization and make them less likely to leave. Absolutely. And with that, it brings us to the end of this episode. This is Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Lorenzo. And I'm Chris. And we'll talk to you all next time.